you'd think the guy who invented money, we might remember him, and, and there is no such record. All right, so he's saying that's one strike against it. So the other thing is, if you hadn't grown up in a society using money, it's kind of a crazy idea. Right? Imagine if you grew up in a society where people were just bartering, and then somebody comes along and says, hey, instead of trading for stuff that you actually want, why don't you trade away your valuable stuff for something you really don't want to use at all, but as long as we can all agree to do that, then it'll be fine, because you'll, you'll get something else. You know, like, let's grab this shell. Nobody likes these shells for anything, but give me your cow for this shell, and don't worry, because whatever you actually want to get, you can just, that person will take the shell as well. Right? That, that sounds crazy. That, that idea, if you've never experienced money firsthand, it sounds like a nutty idea, even though now in, in hindsight we realize that using money is actually very productive. Uh, another problem that Menger pointed out was to say, even if some wise king or some you know, uh, smart intellectual sage came up, dreamt up the idea of, of using money when they had no firsthand experience with it, how would you know what its purchasing power should be? So even if you could get everyone to agree Oh yeah, it would be better if instead of us trading things directly for what we want, we all agree to sell our stuff for these shells, let's say, and then we'll go use the shells to buy whatever it is that we need. So there'll be like a, a middle step in the transaction. Uh, even if we could all agree that that's a sensible way to proceed, how would you know how much stuff a given shell could buy? what its purchasing power would be. That, that also would be completely arbitrary. And so that not only would the king have to sell everybody on the idea of using money, he would also have to lay down what the exchange ratios were, like how many shells for a horse, how many shells for a cow, and so forth. Right? So Menger was just walking through and trying to get to see the, the enormity of the problem that it's, it's not obvious how could you go from a state of not using money to a position of using money without assuming some superhuman intellect along the way and then a lot of force backing it up. So what Menger then gave, and so that seems like, a, well, gee, okay, you, you, you knocked it down, but then what's the solution? He almost makes it look like it's an impossible problem. And what Menger gave, and, and he didn't invent it out of whole cloth. You can see versions of this even in Adam Smith, but Menger kind of crystallized it and explained it really logically, is he gave a step-by-step -step account of how people starting in barter could end up using money even though at no point was that anybody's intention. That nobody in consciously said, let's try to move society so that 10 years from now we're all using money. That no one had any goal like that in mind. They were just doing what was in their immediate self-interest and yet the spontaneous product of those efforts was the creation of what we now call money. All right, so in the interest of time, I'm gonna boil it down really quickly for you. The uh, imagine, so I'm going to make an exaggerated scenario, but just to get the idea, the logic of the argument. So Menger's saying, imagine we have a state of barter, there's no money, we just trade things directly against each other, useful commodities. He said, even in that situation, some would be more marketable than others. There would be certain commodities that lots of people would use, like you know, sugar and flour and bread and, and eggs, where there would be other commodities that would not have a very big market on any given day. So imagine somebody uh, who, who makes like telescopes, like really fancy, intricate telescopes. That's his business, okay, and then he wants to go sell that and he needs to get eggs and, and milk and, and all sorts of sweaters and all sorts of things for his household. In a state of barter, you know, he would have to go out and, and find one other person who had that whole array of goods that he was looking for that he wanted to go to market to ob obtain and that person was looking for the exact kind of telescope that he was bringing to market that day. Okay, so you can see the, the odds of that happening, of those two sorts of people meeting up are vanishingly small, and that's what economists call the problem of the double coincidence of wants.